Come on. Okay. And all right. So here we go. All right. Now, the several of you who are in my next class right after this in 517 um, expect me to forget again. So be prepared to remind me if it looks like I'm going to start yakking and I'm not recording. So you have been notified. <clears throat> OK. Um, now. Um, what we saw last time was. Um, you could think of it as the math 326 approach to solving systems of linear equations. Um, those of you who are not undergrads here as a reference to our introductory linear algebra course. Um, Um, so the idea is if your task of solving AX equals B, then you make the augmented matrix um, A ne next to B, and then go ahead and row reduce um, to get um, an upper triangle, reduce the matrix to upper triangular form, which in that kind of class um, is referred to as row echelon form or just echelon form. Um, in a class like th this, you're probably taught to go further and uh, bring it all the way to reduced echelon form, where A is reduced all the way to the identity matrix. And then you can, what you have is just the uh, solution uh, to, the, to the system of equations. Uh, but that is mathematically equivalent to what I showed on uh, Wednesday, where you form this matrix, you get it to upper triangular form by uh, eliminating entries of A below the diagonal, um, and then use a back substitution to actually obtain the solution um, X. Okay. Um, so, so at this point is where uh, we deviate from uh, what is done in such classes, because in a class like uh, introductory linear algebra class, you're not really thinking about computational efficiency. There's a lot about the theory and so forth. Um, it, it, it's uh, actually I I taught this class I taught that class uh, last semester, um, and um, it's it's terribly impractical to be honest. <laughs> um, so here's where, where where we get practical because what if you have a situation where you're solving a equals b, but you have to solve many such systems where um, Right, right hand side B is uh, constantly changing uh, and the matrix A is uh, staying the same. Now, that sounds like I, I can understand if you feel like that's some made up situation just to justify what I'm about to cover, um, you know, if, if you're feeling particularly cynical. Um, but um, I'm, it, 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 it's not like that. Uh, there, there actually is a reasonable situation where um, that can happen. Um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, because the thing is, when you're performing this row reduction of its augmented matrix, the actual row operations that you perform are dictated entirely by A. And yes, you're performing them on B, but the elements of B do not influence which operations you perform, which multiple of which row do you subtract from which other row. B has nothing to do with that. It's just a victim of it. Um, so. Instead, what you could do is if you just take A and apply those row operations to A, because A has all the information you need to do that, um, and then if you can somehow um, store them, uh, like keep a record of what those operations are, so that whatever B you get later, which could be many different Bs, you could just apply that same sequence of row operations to B. You only apply to A once, because uh, that's expensive, computationally expensive, and then you do it to as many Bs as you need. Um, so that's what we're going to flush out um, in, in this section uh, today. Now, uh, one example that's uh, um, closer to my own research where this happens is, suppose you are uh, solving um, a system of ordinary differential equations, 
and there's many different time stepping methods for doing that, including implicit time stepping methods uh, in which you um, are solving a system of linear equations. Um, and in that situation, the right hand side B represents your solution as a function of time. So the right hand side is varying as you time step. The matrix A, depending on the system of ODEs, may, may well be staying the same. So, um, so it's, it's this exact situation I'm talking about, solving a great many systems where only the right hand side is changing. So this is exactly when you want to do something like this. So then the most of the computational expense comes from row reducing A, but you only do that once, and then every you know, time step after that, you're just working on uh, on B and performing uh, simpler operations. Yeah. <clears throat> so for that purpose, we need what is called the LU decomposition, uh, which is what I'm going to um, uh, derive here. And to, to derive it, we're going to take a look at row operations in a different way. Um, because you can think of row operate, performing a row operation on a matrix as multiplying that matrix on the left by a matrix that just carries out that operation. Now, you may have learned this in your introdu introductory linear algebra course. Um, because you have elementary row operations, and then uh, performing one of those is equivalent to multiplying by what's called an elementary row matrix. Um, and, and here's an example of that. So if, if I'm taking row j, multiplying by some multiplier is mij, which is from the algorithm from last time, and then subtracting it from row i for the purpose of eliminating some element, that's the same as multiplying A and the left by this matrix. That is basically the identity matrix. So we have one all the way down a diagonal. And then in um, this right here, this is uh, column J. And then this is row I. So this um, entry sits in row I column J because that's the element of A that is meant to be eliminated. So multiplying A by this matrix carries out this row operation. <clears throat> now, what kind of a matrix is this? Um, first of all, we can say that it is a lower triangular matrix because all the entries above this main diagonal of ones are, uh, are all zero. Um, but there's something more we can say besides it just being lower triangular that will um, help us. Um, Okay, um, and here's an example of what I'm talking about. So this is uh, like our original matrix, and we want to reduce to upper triangular form by eliminating these entries, the three, four, and two, and then these entries in the second column, and this one entry in the third column. And this is the matrix that results from those row operations. Um, and here we have the actual six row operations that are performed to eliminate these six entries um, that are below the diagonal. And here we have the elementary row matrices that go with them. So for example, in the first column, we want to eliminate three in row two, four in row three, and two in row four. And if we look at the first three elementary row matrices, uh, here we are, here, here, and here, that we put whatever a negative of whatever element we're trying to eliminate in that position, because the uh, diagonal entry we have to divide by is uh, one um, in this case. So, um, so these first three handle the first column, then this one and this one handle the entries in the second column. So this multiplier, or negative multiplier, goes in the appropriate place row in the second column. And then we have one last row operation to eliminate the only subdiagonal entry in the third column, so we put the negative multiplier uh, right here. So those six row operations applied to the original A give this upper triangular form, and then you can go ahead and take those and apply them to whatever vector B you're given, 
and then you have this modified right hand side. So now the system AX equals B is reduced to the system UX equals Y. U is this upper triangular matrix we got from row reduction. Y is a uh, modified right hand side. So the back substitution um, does the rest. Okay. And what do we see here in all of these? What they have in common, they all have ones down the diagonal. Uh, they're all up, they're all lower triangulars, and the, the entire upper triangle is zero. We just have this, some entry sitting somewhere below the diagonal, depending on which entry you're trying to eliminate. Now, um, so what we can do is um, we can actually describe this whole process of Gaussian elimination in terms of these kind of matrices. Now, what, what we have here is, let's suppose A1 is the original matrix, and then A2 is what you get by working on the first column. A3 is what you get by working on the second column to eliminate entries and so forth. So in other words, you eliminate entries of col in column K, and the result we call it AK plus 1. So as you go from one version of a matrix to the next one, what are you doing? You're multiplying by a matrix of this form that is a product of these elementary matrices. Like if I take M21, M31, M41, multiply them all together, then that would be the matrix M1 that when applied to A1, which is the original A, we get A2, which is what which is uh, has those entries in the first column eliminated. So what happens if I were to take these three matrices and multiply them together? Um, now, matrix multiplication is a nasty operation. Uh, it's rather tedious. But it turns out the, the result of multiplying these three is very simple to describe in this case because there's so many zero entries. It is the same structure with all ones down a diagonal. It's all zeros up above. And then in column K, we have the negatives of all the multipliers. So all that happens is those multipliers just stack uh, on top of each other in that one column. So this is a matrix that eliminates whatever entries you need to in column K. So it's lower triangular and ones on the diagonal. So what you can do is um, you can start with A and keep First, you multiply by M1 to work in the first column and M2 to work in the second column. And you keep going all the way through all the columns except the last one. Um, and what is the result? Um, this upper triangular matrix U. <clears throat> and similarly, you can apply those same M's to B to get the modified vector Y so that you can solve a system ux equals y by back substitution. <clears throat> Are any questions up to this point? No, from a lot of notation at you. Now, how we can describe these matrices, yes, they're lower triangular, but more than that, they're unit lower triangular. Um, so, um, okay. Now, um, when you have a lower triangular matrix, and you have a system like that to solve, you can use this process very similar to back substitution. It just goes in reverse. It's forward substitution, uh, which I alluded to last time, but I didn't really uh, go into that. Um, and, um, and with any triangular matrix, upper or lower, uh, it's invertible as long as all of the uh, diagonal entries are non-zero. Now, so the matrices that we've been seeing that implement these row operations, they are unit lower triangular. So a matrix that's lower triangular and has all of the diagonal entries equal to one, that's what you call a unit lower triangular matrix. Now, there are some very nice properties that, um, unit lower triangular matrices have. So 
Um, if you have, um, and, and this is phrased in a rather possibly confusing way just because I was being concise and also lazy. Um, so if you have two unit lower triangular matrices and you multiply them, the product is also unit lower triangular. Same thing if it's upper. So multiplying two matrices of the same triangularity preserves that triangularity. If, if the two matrices are unit, the result is also unit. Um, a unit lower triangular matrix is automatically invertible because all the diagonal entries are equal to one, therefore non-zero. Um, so the inverse is also unit lower triangular. So unit lower triangularity is preserved by multiplication and uh, inversion. And that's going to be very helpful to us And um, a nice, a really nice thing is the inverse is really easy to get in this case um, because um, MK is this matrix where all the multipliers are negated. So to get the inverse of them, and we'll call that LK, uh, we just uh, remove a minus signs. So we just have whatever multipliers we use in Gauss elimination for column K, we just stuff them in the subdiagonal portion of column K. <clears throat> so now what I can do is I'm going to define a matrix L to be a product of L1, L2, etc., all the way to Ln minus one. Um, but that would be the same as a, of a product of all of these inverses of these M's, uh, M1 inverse, M2 inverse, all the way down to Mn minus one inverse. And a really nice thing happens when you multiply all of these together. So each L1, L2, et cetera, has these multipliers in column K. When you multiply all of them together, again, the multipliers just stack on top um, because they're in non-overlapping columns. So here we have the multipliers for column one, for column two, and so on. So what happens is, uh, if I go back to This equation right here, where I have, uh, I take A and I'm multiplying by M1, M2, et cetera, all multiplying to the left until I get through all the columns. Well, now what I can do is suppose I multiply both sides of this equation on the left by Mn minus one inverse, Mn minus two inverse, and, all, and so on, all the way down to M1 inverse to cancel out these one at a time. Well, then what happens is what I have multiplying u on the left is um, L1, L2 up to Ln minus 1. So let me write that out. Um, OK. All right. I want to check something here. Another window, one second. Oh, okay. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna make a copy of that one equation. Let's see. Okay, so let me strip out some things I don't need. Okay, so this is what we have a Gauss elimination process described. Work on column one, work on column two, and down to the end. Now, um,
All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply Okay, by the inverses So, and of course it must do that to both sides. Okay. So, so what we have here is on the right side, everything is going to cancel out. So you see these two are inverses right next to each other, they'll cancel out and so on, all the way down to this M1 inverse, canceling out this M1. And we're left with only A. Um, so what does that leave us? Well, M1 inverse is L1, ways to find. Um, all right. Actually, going to move this. Sorry, I was editing this on the fly here. Okay, so taking this equation here and working with it, um, that I end up with this, but this is LU. All right. And now we know what L looks like as a result of uh, multiplying all these matrices. Um, now, um okay. <sighs> Dang it. I hate when I'm when I'm trying to edit here, it suddenly gets smaller and I have a lot of difficulty fixing it. Um Okay, um, sorry. Now, um, so what we end up with is effectively we factored A into a product of a unit lower triangular matrix L that has all the multipliers, and then the upper triangular matrix U that has the result of Gaussian elimination, the echelon form uh, in its upper triangle. So, um, so you can think of what Gaussian elimination is accomplishing is really it's achieving this factorization and we call this the LU decomposition or also LU factorization either term is used um, so uh, so this is what Gaussian elimination uh, uh, gives us um, just by recording whatever multiples of whatever rows were subtracted from other rows and storing them in this uh, lower triangle of L and then we have our result of uh, elimination um, in U Okay. 
So now that we know that um, gas elimination gives us this factorization and the natural gas elimination process, like carrying out the algorithm I showed last time, will give us every little bit of this factorization. How do we go about solving AX equals B? Because if you look at AX equals B, that's the same as LUX is equal to B. So what you can do is you can take um, this vector UX, which is currently unknown because X is what you're trying to get. And we replace that with Y. So this is the same thing as saying LY is equal to B. So we solve that first. So we still don't know X, but at least by solving this system, we would know Y. Now, this is very easy to solve because L is a unit lower triangular matrix. All we have to do is use forward substitution. Um, so that'll be a, a, a fairly quick process. Then, once we have Y, that goes on the right-hand side here because I des described earlier, UX is equal to Y. Now that we know what Y is, we solve this system to get X. And that is um, solved by back substitution. So the whole process of solving AX equals B is number one, factor A equals LU. Gauss elimination does that. Step two, solve LY equals B um, that, uh, um, by forward substitution. Uh, that gives us y, and then solve ux equals y by back substitution, and there we have x. Now, solving ly equals b <clears throat> is equivalent to taking the row operations that you used in Gauss elimination on a and applying them to b. So, really, you were already doing this. If you think of the like the math three twenty six approach, where you work in the augmented matrix, both a and b both, um, and then proceed to back substitution from there. So gas elimination just did the job on A, only eliminating entries of A, and then performing those same row, row operations on B was just this. We just now have a clear idea of what that really is. All right, and this is the algorithm for forward substitution, which if you were to compare this to back substitution, you'd find that it is uh, very similar. It just, but um, opposite in a sense, because it, it's stepping through rows here, we're stepping through rows from first to last instead of last to first. Um, and here too, we're um, subtracting off terms for multiplying entries of L by previously computed entries of Y. Um, again, we're just proceeding in the opposite order. Um, back substitution included a division after this for loop. We do not need one here because in back substitution, you're dividing by a diagonal entry. Um, but in a unit lower triangular matrix, the diagonal entry is one, so we don't need to do that here. <clears throat> but again, it's important to pay attention to the assumption. We're assuming that L is a unit lower triangular matrix. All right. Um, now, um, Gauss elimination, as I mentioned last time, takes on the order of n cubed floating point operations, but forward and back substitution both require only n squared. Um, so it's nice that we only have to perform Gauss elimination once, then no matter how many different right-hand sides B we have, we can just use forward and back substitution to solve those systems. And that's doing a whole order of magnitude less work than the original um, LU decomposition. OK. Um, so what we can do, as far as storage is concerned, is we can fit L and U in one matrix, because U would occupy the uh, upper triangular part. And then the multipliers go in the strictly lower triangular part. In other words, everything below the diagonal. There's no need to store the diagonal of L because it's all ones, we know what it is, and we, so we, and we don't actually use it anyway. Um, so the output of Gauss elimination could be a single matrix, uh, where the, or U and the very interesting parts of L and U 
um, are mashed together. Um, and then forward and back substitution can just access the appropriate parts of that mashed together matrix to make use of the entries that you need from both uh, uh, L and U. So that's a whole lot more efficient. You, 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 you don't want to work with separate matrices uh, for L and U. And now, okay, now MATLAB's function actually does that because intuitively that's nice, but it's still a waste of storage. <clears throat> and when you get to very large problems, you know, N is, is extremely large, like you know, millions or whatever, those things uh, make a difference. Okay. Okay. Any questions up to this point? Now we're roughly around the halfway point. Okay. Quiet eyes glaze over bunch we have. <laughs> and to speak, we're only halfway of a proof of class period. <laughs> um, um, oh, okay. You said the um, interesting part of the matrix can be accessed by a forward and backward substitution. Mm -hmm. So I know. The forward substitution on um, the backwards back substitution would work with this matrix as the stored, but we might need to like add an identity since it's a unit matrix. Wouldn't we need to add identity to the lower part of LU? Um, actually, no, because um, okay, if we take a look at the um, forward substitution algorithm right here. Yeah. Uh, here are the entries of L, the only entries of L that are being accessed, I, J. And notice that J is always strictly less than I. So it's never, whatever matrix you're giving here to forward substitution, Yeah. it's only accessing that part below the diagonal. It never touches a diagonal entry. So you could have literally anything in there and this algorithm wouldn't care. Oh, I see. Yeah, so basically there's an implicit one. Um, and since, since we never need it. Um, so, so really the only consequence of those diagonal entries being one is that um, we don't divide by anything here. Um, and if it weren't for that, then yeah, we'd have a problem. We'd have... Uh, a need to store both diagonals and that'd be a bit of a problem. But yeah, so um, when, when I was trying to do this, I I kind of extracted like the lower the lower part of LU. Right. And then an identity ago. I thought that since it's a unit triangular, one had to be there. Okay. Um yeah it doesn't actually it doesn't actually you yeah, using this algorithm as written doesn't actually don't have to actually put identity there. It'll oh, still see. work. Okay. Okay. Now, um, it was being a math class and all, of course, we got to talk about existence and uniqueness. Um, so it turns out the um, LU decomposition does not always exist. Uh, so if you're, uh, if you have a given invertible matrix A, um, so, and I, I use these terms interchangeably, so, um, okay. So when I say non-singular, I also mean invertible. Okay. Um, and here's a simple example. What if a one, one entry is zero? You can't comp 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 compute these multipliers. So right off the bat, that's a matrix that would not have an LUD composition. Um, now, if that entry is non-zero, you can at least start, but you might not be able to finish. So how do we know if the LUD composition um, actually exists? Um, here's how you can check. Um, 
we can define what are called the leading principal submatrices. And all those are, if you take all the entries in rows and columns one through K. So the first uh, leading principal submatrix when K is one, is just A11. And then the second one would be the upper left two by two block. Uh, so you'd have A11, A12, A21, A22, and so on. So if it turns out that all of those leading principal submatrices from one to N, if all of them are non-singular, then, and only then, um, does A have an LU decomposition? <clears throat> um, now, if the uh, LU decomposition does exist, um, then it, it is unique. Um, and that's something that, uh, actually, I'm going to take a moment to Um, prove uniqueness. So those are two LED compositions, L1, U1, and LU, L2, U2. Um, and we have to assume that L1 and L2 are both unit lower triangular, and U1 and U2, whoops, capital U2, are upper triangular. Uh, so then what we have is, um, if I set these equal to each other, And then I will multiply. Um, OK. I'll multiply both sides on the left by L2 inverse. And then I'll multiply. Um, both sides on the right by U1 inverse. And then we simplify that as much as we can. Um, so here we have L2 inverse L1. Whoops. And then, and here we have the, uh, here we have the uh, L2s canceling, here we have the U1s canceling. So on the right side, we'll have U2, U1 uh, inverse. Okay. Now. I have a quick question. Shouldn't that second L be a, like the yeah, subscript? Yeah, I'm the subscript. Uh, it should be a, uh, Oh, yeah. Um, all right. Thank you for catching that. Um, OK. Um, all right, everything else is in order. Now, um, left side, what kind of structure does it have? I mean, if L1 and L2 are unit lower triangular, U1 and U2 upper triangular. So what do we know about the left side? It's unit lower triangular. Yeah, it's unit lower triangular because um, L2 inverse is unit lower triangular because triangularity is, is preserved by inversion. And then we multiply, that also preserves unit triangularity. What about the right side? So upper triangular. Yeah. So now we're saying that a unit lower triangular matrix. Um, so if, we, if we set aside unit for the time being, if you have a matrix that's lower triangular, 
and it's also upper triangular, what kind of matrix must that be? Diagonal. Must be diagonal. In other words, the only non-zero entries are on the diagonal because this says that all the entries above a diagonal are zero. This says all the entries below the diagonal are zero. What's left? Only the entries on the diagonal. Um, but what do we know about the diagonal? Yeah, one. Yeah, this is a unit lower triangular matrix. A unit lower triangular matrix has diagonal entries all ones. So what is the diagonal matrix that has ones in the diagonal? What do we call it? So matrix is zero everywhere. Yes. The identity matrix I. So be um so um so if I say L2 inverse L1 is equal to identity, uh we have if I just multiply both sides by L2, then I have L1 equals L2. And same logic applied on the right side. So U1 equals U1 equals U2. Um, so we have uniqueness. Okay. Um, this is a frequently used approach to show uniqueness of certain decompositions. Like you assume that there are two of them and you use whatever properties the decomposition has to show that, uh, and you do some sort of manipulation like this to show that the two, the, all pieces of the two factorizations must be equal. So in fact, we're gonna see another example of this um, uh, on, on Wednesday <clears throat> with a, a different decomposition. Questions about that? All right. Um, so what do we do about the fact that the LUD composition does not necessarily exist? Um, well, we need to fall back on one of the other elementary row operations, one we've not really used at all, um, and that's interchanging rows. So if you find that gas elimination can't proceed, uh, like for instance, because of one, one entry is zero, for example, then you would do a row swap so that you do have something to divide by to define your um, multipliers. Um, so, so this that's called pivoting uh, when you um, interchange rows uh, to let Gaussian elimination go forward. But there's one big problem when it's a computer that's doing all the arithmetic. Here's a, a, a reproduced a main step from Gaussian elimination. Um, so here we have version J of a matrix. And we're getting a new version J plus one by eliminating entries. Um, so what's happening is we're taking elements of row J, multiplying them by the multiplier, subtracting at from row I. So what can happen here is when it's floating point arithmetic, this number here has some floating point error in it. Well, whatever error is in this number is going to affect this one. Now suppose Mij is large, then whatever error we have in here is amplified by this multiplier. So the um, round off error um, in the, all these operations can grow substantially. So even if you don't absolutely have to interchange rows, like 
even if you don't have a concern about division by zero, it's still a good idea to perform row interchanges if it can prevent these multipliers from uh, getting large. So Gaussian elimination, if you don't do anything to uh, constrain, the size, constrain the size of these multipliers, it's actually an unstable algorithm. And um, this is one issue from back in the 60s when um, sort of really the golden age of numerical linear algebra, when, when electronic computers had been invented not much long before, um, and uh, they were being used to solve systems linear equations, naturally using Gaussian elimination. And a lot of researchers in the area were concerned that maybe Gaussian elimination was not a viable way to solve AX equals B. I could even imagine, I mean, this is the method that's taught everywhere. Um, and because they thought that uh, with, a, with a computer to be arithmetic and the error inherent in that, that it would just grow out of control and that then you could no longer trust the result. Um, and it was uh, uh, Jim Wilkinson, um, who uh, his main work was on the eigenvalue problem, but he also uh, performed a very careful analysis of Roundoff error propagation in Gaussian elimination. And what he proved that um, with at least with pivoting being used, that Gaussian elimination with pivoting is a numerically stable algorithm. Um, so if, if it turned out not to be true, then numerical linear algebra would be totally different today. Um, but it gave a confidence that people needed to continue using it on these newfangled electronic computers they had back then. <clears throat> so how should we interchange rows to make sure that these multipliers um, are small? There's different ways of doing that. I'll just show you two. The most commonly used is called, um, okay, I'm gonna put this on a new page. All right, um, partial pivoting. Now, these equations are pretty tedious to understand, but I'll, I'll give you an intuitive idea. That what you're doing is you're, you're in column J, and you're using row J to eliminate all the entries in column J below the diagonal. So what do you do is you examine that part of column J from a diagonal on down. You find the largest in absolute value of all of those entries. So we're looking at column J from a diagonal to the bottom. And you find so you find out where that entry is. So it turns out to be in row P, wherever it might be. It's somewhere in this range. That's how you swap. So if if row P is different from row J, then you interchange those rows. So by taking the largest element, the largest entry in that portion of column J and moving it to the diagonal position, now this denominator is as large as possible, thus guaranteeing that these multipliers will be less than or equal to one in magnitude. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the idea behind partial pivoting. That and, and I'll explain why it's called partial after I contrast it with the next technique, which is complete pivoting. Um, now, this requires a fair amount of work for comparison comparisons because you're comparing elements of uh, each column as you go from column one to to the end. Um, but there's a total of order n squared comparisons to figure out which rows you're going to swap. But gas elimination as a whole is order n cubed arithmetic operations. So, um, so, so this amount of work is not a big deal. Um, and that's why people are perfectly fine uh, using it. Okay. So this keeps the entries of L small, but the same is not true of the entries of U. Um, and actually, I think it might be one of the homework problems I assigned. I'm not, I don't remember. Um, it is one of the problems that's in this section, whether I assigned it or not. That shows how the entries of U can grow quite big. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, so this is something that, that really helps. Um, another option is complete pivoting. And um, 
it's a very similar idea. But what you do is you're not just looking in column J. Um, oh. Oops. Something is. There's a typo here. Oh man, I, I'll have to fix this in the book. Dang it. <laughs> That's the problem. With teaching these classes, I end up finding more typos in the book. I swear there are infinitely many in there. Um, okay. So uh, I goes from J to N. And then I'll need to change this letter to. Um, okay. K and then put a K in here. OK, so what I do is I look at rows and columns J through N. So instead of searching one por portion of one column and searching a whole sub matrix, um, so much larger area, finding the largest entry in that portion of a matrix. And then um, I, I swap um, rows and columns. So if I find the largest entry in row P column Q, then I go ahead and swap rows and columns to put that into the JJ position. Um, so this makes the multipliers even smaller because you're searching a larger portion of the matrix. Now, but the problem is you are, um, you're doing more comparisons because you're searching as many as you know, N squared entries per column. Um, so the uh, overhead is uh, much more significant. Now, this does make the algorithm more stable. So that's one reason why some people still use it. But generally, partial pivoting is preferred. Um, but because it's so much less work and it still gets the job done of uh, keeping multipliers small. So now I got to make a note of that error before I forget. <clears throat> It's one of the advantages of not many people using this book yet is that I'm still the one who's finding errors instead of somebody else. Um, although one of my colleagues at Dartmouth did use this book um, last summer and she didn't catch this. Um, okay. Now, uh, page 97. OK. Um, so how does this affect the whole gas elimination LUD composition process if now and then you are interchanging rows? And I'm just going to focus on partial pivoting here. Um, so what happens is when you're swapping rows, again, we're multiplying by elementary matrix on the left. And this time it's a permutation matrix that rearranges rows. Excuse me, so how do you define a permutation matrix? Whatever rows you want to swap, you swap those rows of identity. And that gives you your permutation matrix. And um, all right, I think I have an example. All right. Um, OK, I'll, I'll show the example first, and then I'll continue of the other stuff up above. Like in this example, I want to swap rows two and three, because here I have a zero here. I can't use that to eliminate this element. So if I swap rows two and three, here I've swapped rows two and three of identity, and that is my permutation matrix. So multiplying A2 by this permutation matrix P2 gives me this product A3 where the rows have been swapped. And actually now it is upper triangular, so there's nothing more for me to do. Okay, so this is an example of a permutation matrix. Um, now, a little bit more about permutation matrices. Um, so we can still describe Gauss elimination in terms of matrix multiplication, that we're just multiplying by different kinds of, we're multiplying A by different kinds of elementary row matrices, either swapping or subtracting a multiple of a row from another row uh, to end up with an upper triangular matrix uh, U. Um, 
Now, a permutation matrix has a property. P transpose P is equal to identity. In other words, its transpose is its inverse. Now, this is very important. This, um, this is called orthogonality. So when a matrix satisfies this, it is um, an orthogonal matrix. And we're going to be dealing a ton with orthogonal matrices pretty much for the rest of the semester, like have, from chapters uh, uh, four, five, and six. Um, so, um, so, so you definitely want to uh, make a note of this term. Uh, it's going to come up all the time. Um, and uh, we, we call it an orthogonal matrix because um, each entry of this product, Q transpose Q, is column I of Q dot product with column J of Q. This is a dot product. Um, and it's equal to zero whenever I is not equal to J. And if I is equal to J, then it's equal to one. That's giving us the identity matrix. Um, so the fact that these are columns, so these columns are actually form an orthonormal set because they're orthogonal to one another. And by virtue of their dot product with themselves being one, this is the magnitude squared. So these are unit vectors. Um, so, so when vectors are orthogonal and normalized, we say they're orthonormal. Now, I'm not sure why they don't call Q that satisfies this a orthonormal matrix because the columns are orthonormal, but they call it orthogonal. So whatever, I don't make the rules. Um, I want to make you aware of this notation here. Um, capital Q is equal to Q1, et cetera, up to QN. This is called a column partition, and you will, we will be seeing a lot of this. Um, so a way of expressing a matrix in terms of its columns. <clears throat> All right, now I won't really, I'll have a lot more to say about orthogonal matrices uh, later on in the semester, but I just wanted to point it out um, in this case, using the fact that its transpose is its inverse. Um, so in effect, what's happening is, if you take a permutation matrix that swaps rows, then the transpose of that matrix has the effect of undoing that swap and bringing you back to where you started. And that's going to come in handy for us in a bit. All right. So, so here's a matrix A that actually does not have an LUD composition because we perform Gaussian elimination and eliminate the two and the three in the first column. And this is what we're left with. And actually, here's a way you can tell it doesn't have an LUD composition. Look at this two by two matrix up top, one, four, two, eight. If you look at just that two by two matrix, one, four, two, eight, but determinant is zero. So it's singular or not invertible. And uh, remember what I showed you earlier that uh, all of the pr leading principal sub matrices must be non singular for A to have the LUD composition. So sure enough, we wind up with a zero down here. Um, so um, we need to swap rows in order to continue. So we go ahead and swap rows two and three. And then there's nothing more to do, that the matrix is um, now upper triangular um, and we're done. Um, so another way of looking at it is, suppose I had started with A, the original A, and then swapped the rows first, swapped rows two and three. Then that matrix, so if I had taken this matrix and swapped rows two and three, then it would have an LU decomposition. Um, and uh, so that gets factored into LU. So A equals LU is nonsense, undefined. PA equals LU does work. So here's my original A. We swap rows two and three, and then we have this LU factorization. And notice that... Um, here we have a two and three in the first column, but now they're swapped. That's why I have three and two down here for the uh, multipliers, uh, because we're performing LU decomposition on the swapped row swapped version of the original matrix A. And then the matrix U that results from Gauss elimination and swapping is what we have here. So we're no longer looking for A equals LU, we're looking for PA equals LU.
But how do we achieve that? Because here's what happened in the preceding example. I started with A, I did some elimination, and then I swapped, and then bam, I have U. But the thing is, I don't have an easy way to write that as PA equals LU because I can't multiply these matrices in any order I want. I can't move these around. Um, so um, I don't have a, I need a way to arrange this in such a way to get PA equals LU. So how can I do that? I have to do a little um, algebraic trickery to uh, make that happen. Um, so what I do is, if I take this equation and I repro reproduce it down here, but then between M1 and A, I put P2 transpose P2. Remember, this is identity because P2 is orthogonal. So I can just stick that in there. Now, what I can do is, um, If I define M1 tilde to be equal to this right here. Um, so what, what I've done is I've taken M1, which is this matrix right here, and I've swapped the multipliers. So I have minus three and minus two instead of minus two minus three. Now, to swap these, minus two and minus three, all I have to do is swap these rows. That means multiplying by P2 on the left. Can anyone tell me, why did I have to also multiply by this on the right? Multiplying on the right swaps columns instead of rows. Can anyone tell me why I had to do this to get this? Is it because of the way matrix multiplication works? Um, in a way, but I, I think I need you to elaborate. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, well, look at what ha think of what happens when, because because notice the only difference between these two and these two matrices is the minus two and the minus three swapped. But if I took P two and its job is to swap rows two and three. What else is that going to do to this matrix that I don't want? Let's see. It's going to also swap the diagonal entries. So we're going to yeah. have one on the second row. Yeah, these entries down here, these will be swapped and it'll ruin unit lower triangular structure. This fixes it. This swaps columns two and three to restore unit lower triangular form. Um, and the thing is, whatever um, multipliers I'm trying to swap are in column one. By swapping columns two and three, I do not disturb the thing I wanted to keep over here because P2 takes care of this, messes this up. Well, this multiplication here fixes this, will not disturb what I have here that I want to keep. So it all works out beautifully. Um, so now what do I have? Then what I could do is um, I can then multiply both sides by M tilde, M1 tilde inverse, and that is my L. So now I have PA equals LU, where L is the inverse of this. And now I have things ordered in the way I want. Now, that was just one example, a small one. What I could do in general is um, if I um, do swap, eliminate, swap, eliminate, swap, eliminate, then these are my permutation matrices that work on column one, column two, and, and so on. Um, and then L is a product of these where each one of these M tildes is defined by taking my original M that does the elimination in the course of Gauss elimination and multiplying by, um, oh, you know what? Hold on. 
There's a mistake here. I need to check something I'd written down below. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, P2, P2 transpose. Sorry, my notes here are all thrown off. Um, Because this is inconsistent. Okay. Err, I'm running out of time. Dang it. Okay. All right. Um, I'll have to check it later, but based on working with this, I need to move these transposes. Okay. All right, so I need transposes over here. And not here. Okay, but I'm going to have to check my off-site manipulations later. Um, okay. Um, now, this sounds like a real pain to do all this. Like, you figure out your um, multipliers to work on column J, and then do all this scrambling. But it turns out you don't really have to do that during the actual algorithm, like if you, that you'd implement in MATLAB, for instance. So what you can do is... Um, once you decide to swap rows, um, so like let's say you, you've already gone through some columns and then you come to a point like, oh, I need to swap rows. What you do is you swap the entire row um, of your, because remember you're, you're matching L and U into one matrix. So when you swap rows, you're not just dealing with a portion of U that you're still working on, but also the multipliers in those rows that you already have. Uh, from prior columns. So as long as you do that, that will fix everything. Um, so so it's really easy to handle this at a coding level um, compared to what we saw here. Um, and the reason why this works is that um, what, what was, what's happening is I'm... Um, I'm applying permutations um, to this matrix that occur after those multipliers were stored because of I being greater than J. Um, okay. Now, um, yeah, something definitely. Mm. Yeah, something seems definitely messed up here in this one equation I have. Sorry, I, I did this in the fly, and I'll just have to fix it. Um, and I, it's not something I can do during class because I, I don't have time. Um, all right. Once you have this decomposition, now it's PA equals LU. So now you multiply AX equals B on both sides by P. So they have PB now. So then PA is replaced with LU. So now you're solving this. LUX is equal to PB. So we proceed like before. We say UX is equal to Y. So we solve LY equals PB by forward substitution. So whatever swaps you did, row swaps within A, you also have to do the same swaps in B, then you do forward substitution, and then you solve UX equals Y. So that's how the whole AX equals B solution process unfolds when pivoting is uh, uh, taken into account. Um, <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> so now you're storing the um, multipliers that are used. You have a result of gas elimination, the U, and in P, you're storing what row interchanges, if any, were made. So then you have a full record of what happened during gas elimination, including row interchanges, and then that you can use to uh, efficiently solve any AX equals B that comes up with that from that matrix A and whatever right-hand side B um, you get. All right. Um, so, so now we have a process of gas elimination decomposed in such a way that it could be applied efficiently in those kind of situations. And um, matrix decomposition is a very important ingredient in numerical linear algebra. We're going to see it many decompositions uh, throughout the semester for solving uh, different problems. So, something to uh, uh, you'll be you'll be getting used to. Okay. Well, I am out of time. Uh, looks like I got something to fix in my notes. Dang it. Um, but uh, <laughs> I hate when that happens, but I guess especially those of you who teach, you've been there. Um, <laughs> so, um, and you know what? As you get more experienced, it still happens. Yay. Um, <laughs> but hopefully less often. Um, so I guess I will see several of you in 15 minutes. Whether I can fix this by then is another matter. Oh, I'm going to. Uh, well, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, I, I had a question. I don't know if it's you, you have the time for it. Um, when we're talking about pi pivoting, I think partial pivoting, you said we had other n squared comparison. Yeah. I'm not sure how. Like, when we're comparing, we use a loop. And so, yeah. But that loop is just one loop that runs, say, n times. So how do we get the other n squared? Well, it's n comparisons for the first column, then n minus one for the second column, n minus two for the third, and so on. So it's uh, um, so you get a grand total of like that that that's a formula n times n plus one over two. Um, so roughly that many uh, comparisons, um, or I guess it's really n minus one, n minus two, n minus three, all the way down to one. Um, so because it's happening over all the columns. OK, I see. So, sorry. We are comparing rows. So we, we take a particular column and look for the largest element in that column, right? Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, so that's going to take n minus one comparisons right there. Um, and then, um, then we move on to the second column. Uh, so after we eliminate in the first column, then we go on to the second column, and this whole process repeats uh, with one element less. Okay, so that means we are summing n, and then we use the summation formula. Yes. Yeah, because if n minus one, n minus two, all the way down to one. Okay. Yeah, so it's roughly n squared over two comparisons in total. Okay. Oh. Alrighty. Okay, we've probably gone too far over time, but um, but anyone else have any questions? Definitely let me know. Um, ah, nice cat. <laughs> um. All right, I will stop recording at this point and see some of you in a bit. <laughs>